early childhood programs with the hope of standardizing the approach to vision screening, improving follow-up for eye care, providing family-friendly educational information, and consultation with some of the nation's leading pediatric eye care providers to ensure best practices, who you will certainly hear from today. The Air Children's Vision was initiated by and is supported by several leading national vision health organizations and companies. Those include, obviously, the National Head Start Association, School Health, who I would like to thank for graciously hosting the webinar today, the American Association of Pediatric Ophthalmology and Strabismus, Good Life Corporation, the National Center for Children's Vision and Eye Health at Prevent Blindness America, and finally supported by the American Academy of Optometry, Section on Binocular Vision, Perception, and Pediatric Optometry. Next slide, please. So the goal of our webinar today is to help you, the frontline screeners, and those that are shaping vision health programs for young children, to understand the importance of vision screening for those children, and learning a little bit today about which children should be directly referred for ICM rather than first participating in a vision screening. And on that note, I want to just uh, take a moment to describe um, the feelings around vision screenings and eye exams. Vision screenings and eye exams are a complementary approach to assessing eye problems. They're not competing healthcare strategies. A vision screening, whether conducted by a primary care physician, school nurse, a educational provider in a community-based setting, is not a diagnostic process. It does not replace a comprehensive eye examination by an eye doctor, but it is an appropriate and essential element of a strong public health approach to vision care. The purpose of vision screening is to increase the number of individuals in need of eye care who ultimately receives that comprehensive eye exam and their necessary eye treatment. The purpose of a vision screening is to identify possible vision problems in an early treatable stage, provide education, and make a referral to an eye care provider for that comprehensive eye exam if it's needed. So I want you to keep that in mind today as we go through the webinar. Next slide, please. I mentioned that through the year of children, you'll be hearing from some of the nation's leading pediatric eye care providers, and we're pleased to have four of them with us today. Uh, we'll first be hearing from Dr. Jean Ramsey, followed by Dr. Jeffrey Bradford, Bruce Moore, and with us today is also uh, Dr. Sandy Block, who may still have some laryngitis, so we'll see how she does today. Um, and then I'll provide a biography for each of those presenters as we get started. Next slide, please. So our first presenter today is Dr. Jean Ramsey. Dr. Ramsey is a magna cum laude graduate of Boston University School of Medicine. And she did her ophthalmology residency, chief residency, and pediatric fellowship at Tufts New England Medical Center. And she specializes in pediatric ophthalmology and strabismus. After working as an attending physician at both Tufts and, Tufts and Massachusetts Eye and Ear Infirmary, she was recruited back to her alma mater, where she is now an associate professor of ophthalmology and pediatrics Vice Chair of Education and Residency Program Director for the Boston Medical Center Department of Ophthalmology. She is also Associate Dean for Alumni Affairs at Boston University School of Medicine, and she received her Master's in Public Health degree with honors from Boston University School of Public Health in 2008. Dr. Ramsey has leadership responsibilities in many professional organizations, including the American Academy of Ophthalmology, for which she was elected Chair of the Council and served on the Board of Trustees for four years, stepping down recently in 2012. She's been active locally and nationally in the legislative and regulatory arena, focusing on programs to ensure children's optimal health and visual development. She was a member of the uh, expert panel for the National Center for Children's Vision and Eye Health, and currently serves as vice chair of the leadership advisory panel for the National Center, both of which were funded by the Maternal and Child Health Bureau. Through collaborative activities, Dr. Ramsey has successfully advocated for a number of legislative and public health initiatives on the local, regional, and national level, such as the development of preschool vision screening programs, shaken baby prevention programs, services for patients with developmental disabilities, and serves as a part of the leadership team for the Year of Children's Vision. And with that, I proudly give you Dr. Jean Ramsey. Well, thank you, Kara, very much, and I'm very happy to be here today, and thanks for the folks who have organized this session. So today, let me address some of the eye disorders and diseases that we hope to detect when we talk about vision screening. So why do a vision screen? Certainly, we want 
two identified children who, instead of having normal vision, have a reduction in their vision. They may even have severe or profound vision loss. Clearly, these children suffer not just vision loss, but things that interfere with their development and their activity in other areas. But what about young children? Why do we do early vision screening on those preschoolers, the three to five years old? Certainly, while most of them are very cooperative, some at times can be a bit challenging. And we do have a reason. We need to identify children who are at risk of permanent vision loss from a condition called amblyopia. So what is amblyopia? Amblyopia, we have a child who is healthy, who has normal, healthy eyes. If they need glasses, we put the glasses on them. And in spite of that, they don't see the way they should. Because something has interfered with their vision during the early years of life, from birth to eight or nine years of age. That's a time when the brain in children is flexible and the visual pathways are actually developing. So something interferes. It's a fairly common condition affecting 2 to 4 percent of children. So amblyopia leads to irreversible permanent vision loss if it's not detected and not treated. It can be treated, but only during those early years of life. From looking at a child, we can't tell that a child has amblyopia. Many children with amblyopia look perfect, and if you observe them in their activities, they are functioning very, very well. So we need a way to identify them. So let's ask the question, what do we need for normal visual development? Okay, so what do we mean by visual development? There are three requirements. One is the eyes have to be healthy. And the visual centers have to be healthy and intact. So that's one. Number two, the eyes need to be straight so that the brain is getting a similar image from each of the eyes and can merge that image into a single image. And number three, the eye has to process and the brain has to receive a very sharp, clear image. So those are the requirements. Conditions that can interfere with normal visual development mirror what we just discussed. One, there's a structural problem so that the brain is not receiving any image. Number two, the eyes are not straight. They're misaligned, and we call that strabismus. And the third condition would be if the image that is being transmitted to the brain is blurry in one of both eyes. Those are the three conditions that can have significant impact. Let's look at the first one, deprivation, a structural problem. You see the picture here, little infant, and if you look in the center of their eye, there's a dense white opacity. The image cannot be processed. We look in the lower picture. We see a child who has a droopy eyelid. In this case, it's profoundly drooping so that it's not allowing any visual information to be processed. This is a serious condition. In fact, we call it an emergency because it has to be identified and treated within the first few months of life. Now, generally, it's the primary care physician who would be making this diagnosis, but we should all realize how important it is that this get detected and referred very early. So what about misaligned eyes? People ask, when should a child's eyes be straight? Well, certainly, we've got a little six-week-old here. And if you look really carefully, you'll see that left eye is a little bit out. Children, when they're born, their eyes are not straight. But early in life, by two to three months of age, when that child is awake, alert, and really looking at you, the eye should be straight. So any misalignment in children after that time, even if it's intermittent, needs to be evaluated. With strabismus, the eyes can turn in different directions. They can drift outward, and we call that exotropia. So see here, you see a child whose eyes look pretty straight. 
And maybe 10 minutes later, we see the right eye is drifting out. Oftentimes in this condition, we see this when the child is tired, when they're daydreaming. We may see it worse when they're looking at things far away. And a little tip off, if you see a child outside who pretty much persistently closes one eye when they're out of doors, they may in fact have this disorder. The eyes can also turn inward. We call that esotropia. And again, it may be intermittent. You may notice it more when the child is focusing up close. The first image, I don't think anyone would miss that. We have a large amount of crossing inward. But the middle image is much less. The point being that any amount of crossing, whether it's a large amount or small amount, can have devastating visual consequences. The bottom picture shows a child whose eye is drifting up. All of these conditions need to be evaluated. What happens with crossed eyes? People ask, does a child see double when their eyes are crossed? Certainly as an adult, if you had straight eyes and developed misaligned eyes, you would have horrible double vision. But I guess you would say the good news is because of the flexibility in the brain, the brain is able to ignore the image from the eye that's crossed. That's a process we call suppression. So the child does not experience double vision. But there's a flip side to that. Because the vision has been ignored, again, those visual processes do not develop, and the eye that is crossed begins to lose vision, amblyopia. The last category is blurry vision. So if a child has to do a lot of focusing and is unable to do that focusing, the brain constantly receives a blurry image. So the child will, will not develop his or her full visual potential. Oftentimes, the eyes are straight. By looking, again, you have no idea that there was a vision problem. And sometimes, there's not a lot of focusing problems going on, but the eyes are different. In this case, the child's left eye is farsighted, and the right eye is nearsighted. Again, the brain cannot use both of those eyes at the same time. One eye is ignored is ignored, in this case the right eye, and that eye loses vision and develops amblyopia. The treatment for this would be a discussion for another time, but typically we have to treat these children with glasses, and since they see fine out of their one better seeing eye, it can be challenging, but definitely possible. So in summary, these are the take home points. Structural problems like deprivation, Misaligned eyes, strabismus, and blurry vision can interfere with normal visual development and lead to loss of vision that we call amblyopia. Many of these problems we can't identify just by observing the child. We need a method such as vision screening that can detect a problem. Then the child can be sent to an eye care provider where they can be diagnosed and treatment started if necessary. Without treatment, have no doubt, amblyopia results in permanent visual loss in one of both eyes. But if it's detected early in life, amblyopia is treatable and reversible in nearly all cases. So we're very grateful for the vision screening performance standards by Head Start and other early education organizations. These standards of early vision screening and follow-up care ensure that all children will have the opportunity to develop their best visual potential. And I know you'll all agree with me that kids deserve it. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Ramsey. And again, if you have questions for Dr. Ramsey, please type those into um, the question portion on your screen. Our next presenter is Dr. Jeffrey Bradford. Dr. Bradford is a pediatric ophthalmologist at West Virginia University and is the consulting ophthalmologist to the West Virginia Schools for the Deaf and Blind. He completed his master's degree and MD degree at Pennsylvania State University, his ophthalmology residency at Children's Hospital Medical Center in Akron, Ohio, and this fellowship in pediatric ophthalmology at Scottish Rite Children's Hospital 
of Emory University in Atlanta. In 2001, Dr. Bradford established the West Virginia Vision Initiative for Children to provide training and support for vision screening to West Virginia's primary care providers, school nurses, and Head Start personnel. He's also the Vice Chair for the American Association of Pediatric Ophthalmology's Vision Screening Committee and serves on the Executive Committee of the AAP Section on Ophthalmology. Ladies and gentlemen, I give you Dr. Bradford. So good afternoon, everybody. Uh, that's a nice introduction. Thank you, uh, Kira. Uh, my patients tend to call me Dr. Jeff without all of the uh, other accolades. But uh, it's a pleasure to be with you, and uh, certainly a privilege to uh, be part of this afternoon's webinar. Uh, the slide in front of you uh, is, in fact, somewhat of a summary of what I'd like to uh, discuss over the next few minutes uh, and what we'll be uh, addressing at uh, this point in time is why it is so important to detect vision problems that children may have so early. Uh, Dr. Ramsey started this discussion. Uh, I'll, uh, I'll emphasize some of the points she's already made and uh, perhaps uh, present some new details as well. One of those details is our first bullet here, that there is a critical period, a critical developmental period for vision development in the initial years of a child's life. In other words, uh, when we talk about this issue of amblyopia primarily, there's only a certain period in early childhood when the uh, brain is uh, actively developing and when problems that affect the brain, which is really what amblyopia is, can really be remediated through treatment. Once the, uh, the section of the brain that uh, addresses vision processing has fully developed, and as uh, Dr. Ramsey mentioned, that's about age, age eight or nine, it's, it's impossible to manipulate the development of the brain uh, after that. And so any um, amblyopia, any decrease in vision from strabismus or from a misalignment of the eyes, from not wearing glasses appropriately, et cetera, that is going to become a permanent vision problem. Uh, I've alluded to the second bullet already. Early treatment provides better results. And uh, certainly uh, when we can have the opportunity to identify a child who uh, appears to be having a problem, we can make that diagnosis, we can start treatment, and we can certainly do a lot before the child becomes uh, school age and, uh, and better prepare a child for kindergarten and grade school if we can start treatment before the kids become that school age. I've made the third bullet point already, I think. After the early critical years of life, amblyopia does not respond well to treatment and efforts, treatment efforts and uh, vision loss is indeed permanent. So if vision loss is permanent, what does that translate uh, as into as the child goes from early childhood to later childhood and into the adult years? Well, people who have done research in this area have uh, uh, been able to show that adults who have untreated amblyopia, in other words, who still have uh, poor vision and uh, in one eye, they are at a significantly increased risk of actually losing vision in not just their amblyopic eye, but also in their remaining good eye. And this is because they have a, a, a decrease in their depth perception. They have a decrease in their uh, peripheral vision. And all of these things, in a sense, tend to make uh, an adult a little bit more accident prone. And so what things can actually um, cause us to lose vision in our good eye if we were an adult uh, growing up with uh, poorly treated or untreated amblyopia. Well, I think uh, all of us are familiar through uh, parents and grandparents that uh, adults can get a, an eye disease, such as uh, glaucoma and, and other diseases, and uh, I'll address that in a second. Um, or there can be injuries at work, and not just at work, but at home or um, when adults are out uh, playing, doing recreational sports, and whatnot. 
So this slide here is a repeat of what Dr. Ramsey uh, was uh, showing earlier, that uh, this issue of amblyopia, and, and I'll emphasize, amblyopia typically involves one eye. And this is why uh, parents uh, very frequently will not recognize that the child is actually having a problem, because a very young person does not go around comparing their vision in the right eye with by covering the left eye and vice versa. So the, the youngsters who are uh, one, two, three, four years old uh, certainly appear to have normal vision, but unbeknownst to their family, if there's not strabismus uh, and they haven't had a vision screening, the poor vision development in uh, the opposite eye may actually go unrecognized. So the whole point of amblyopia is that you have poor vision development in the brain because of an abnormality in typically one, but uh, occasionally in both eyes as well. So um, Dr. Ramsey went over the causes. Uh, I'll briefly mention that the way we treat amblyopia as uh, physicians is we have to address the problem in the, quote, bad eye um, by, if it's a refractive problem, giving the child glasses. Uh, if it's a strabismus problem, perhaps glasses will work, uh, but sometimes uh, eye muscle surgery is needed. Uh, in the picture that Dr. Ramsey showed of the infant with uh, cloudy pupils and, and congenital cataracts, cataract surgery would be needed uh, to treat the, um, the bad eye. That baby is an example that Dr. Ramsey showed of bilateral uh, amblyopia because both eyes had dense cataracts there. So we have to address the problem that's creating the amblyopia in the bad eye. And then we have to penalize the, the eye that has developed vision more appropriately. And so uh, perhaps many of you are already aware that uh, doctors will put a patch over the good eye. Uh, this can be a, a Band-Aid style patch as in the uh, top right picture there, or a felt type patch that slips on over a pair of glasses. You can imagine many children really do not appreciate having their only good eye covered up, and it certainly is a frustrating uh, treatment uh, option for parents because very willful children certainly uh, make it very difficult for parents to uh, maintain enough patching to ultimately help the brain develop or to stimulate vision development in, um, in the youngsters who, who have amblyopia in the opposite eye. So there's an alternative to patching that uh, is, has come into vogue over um, many years, and this is atropine eye drops. Atropine eye drops, if you put the eye drop on, in the eye that has the good vision, will dilate the pupil, but more importantly, it will create some blurred vision on that side. So the good eye is uh, blurred by using eye drops, and blurring the good eye is felt to be nearly quite uh, nearly as good as putting a patch over the good eye. So parents do not have to manage a patch, but they do have to put an eye drop uh, in the child's eye uh, a couple of mornings a week to, uh, to treat the amblyopia that way. Later on, uh, after the early years, uh, when kids are getting towards school age and into high school and into adulthood, if their amblyopia hasn't been uh, completely uh, remediated, then it's important to recognize that they're going to have amblyopia for the rest of their lives. The amblyopic eye will probably not improve any further, and it, and it becomes then important to uh, protect the remaining uh, good eye by using safety glasses, using sport goggles, and I'm very cautious about uh, prescribing contact lenses to youngsters if they only have uh, good vision in one eye. Um, it's not mandatory that they not wear contacts, but you can imagine if they ever get an inf a contact lens infection in their only good eye and it leads to scar tissue on their eye, they're going to be losing vision from that scar tissue and that's their only good eye. So uh, parents who ask about contact lenses really need to be aware of the potential of uh, problems with those contacts in the only good eye. So I talked about the increased risk of uh, 
uh, vision loss in the um, in the remaining good eye. Usually in uh, young people, this comes from accidents, uh, a BB gun uh, injury to the good eye. Uh, you can anything that can cause an injury. Um, I've seen happen to children. Sticks in the woods, uh, a baseball that's not caught accurately or is pitched inaccurately, striking the eye, um, pencils at school, dog bites. The sharp corners of coffee tables are, are very dangerous for youngsters if they should happen to fall into that corner and strike their eye. Uh, children playing with pocket knives or whittling. Uh, I've seen knife injuries from children um, carving pumpkins at, uh, at Halloween time, uh, bike accidents, uh, throwing darts, and uh, not being uh, supervised by parents. All sorts of things can, can certainly cause an injury in the remaining good eye. Into adulthood, uh, I've mentioned uh, there can be the natural onset of eye diseases like glaucoma, uh, diabetic retinopathy can cause blindness in the in uh, the remaining good eye. An elderly person who has a stroke uh, can go blind in the remaining good eye. Uh, we're all becoming very familiar with the scourge of macular degeneration, which uh, is affecting more and more elderly people, and for which uh, treatment uh, options are still, unfortunately, rather limited. So, uh, an eye disease can prematurely take a person who is otherwise productive at work and thriving in, uh, in their lives and in their communities and uh, suddenly cause them to uh, become disabled because of the amblyopia that pre-existed in their bad eye and now the new problem that has affected their uh, good eye. Same thing with uh, uh, accidents at work. Uh, and at home, and as I mentioned, uh, recreationally. So this is really the essence of uh, this afternoon's uh, webinar, uh, why annual screening is so important. Uh, these, uh, these screenings really should be serial screenings uh, once a year. Uh, it, it, I, I'd like you to appreciate that one vision screening in a youngster's uh, early childhood is, is not adequate, that uh, vision screening really should be done repetitively throughout the child's uh, early childhood, uh, and the American Academy of Pediatrics recommends about once a year. These screenings determine which healthy children with no apparent eye symptoms and no family history of eye problems uh, may still uh, warrant a visit to their pediatrician, their primary or eye care provider, primary care provider for uh, further assessment. And the reason uh, this, uh, I'm mentioning this is that really 95% of infants and young children really do have healthy eyes and normal vision development. So these vision screenings as a public health policy help us to identify the 5% of children who don't have healthy uh, vision development. While we can identify the, this 5% who don't have healthy vision, we, uh, we can allow the children, the 95% who do have healthy eyesight and healthy development, we can keep them at, at school, we can keep their parents at work, and we can manage the limited health care dollars that are available uh, in our country. I also mentioned uh, a little caveat that uh, many physicians uh, in, and, uh, in my field uh, would actually appreciate the assistance of the primary care provider uh, in, ter in, uh, the, in terms of helping these children who've had a failed vision screening. Um, pediatricians really know best what the health care concerns and the unmet needs of their patients are. And they also know in their areas who the best qualified eye care specialists are for uh, children. And so uh, it, it's the feeling of many pediatric ophthalmologists that the children who, um, who fail a vision screen actually be referred to the pediatrician. And so the pediatrician can confirm the uh, failed vision screen and that the child can be referred 
to an eye care specialist out of the pediatrician's office. Another reason for involving the pediatrician is that many times uh, people will have a health care plan that does not allow an eye doctor to be the, the primary referral source. Sometimes uh, children have to go through their primary uh, care provider in order to get uh, authorization and have their insurance pay for the, uh, the vision assessment. So those are the points that I'll make in my section, and I certainly thank you for your attention, and I'll uh, turn the microphone back over uh, for our next speaker. Great. Thank you, Dr. Jeff. Um, again, if you have questions specific to um, Dr. Jeff's presentation, please put those in the, uh, the question portion on your, your chat box and direct it to his attention. And uh, I'm pleased to introduce our next presenter, Dr. Bruce Moore. Dr. Moore's career as a pediatric optometrist has been devoted to studying the visual problems and therapeutic options for young children. His optometric career began at the Boston Children's Hospital Department of Ophthalmology and the Harvard Medical School, where he practiced, taught, and carried out his research interests in pediatric eye care for 22 years. Dr. Moore assumed the position of the Marcus Professor of Pediatric Studies in the New England College of Optometry in 1997 and served as department chair for over a dozen years. Dr. Moore has published about 200 papers, posters, chapters, and two textbooks on a variety of subjects in pediatric optometry. His text, I Care for Infants and Young Children, published in 1997, became the standard textbook in pediatric optometry for students and practitioners. His clinical practice is currently on a mobile exam van that services young children in underserved communities in the Boston area. Dr. Moore is active in an array of research and policy efforts involving vision of children, He's been a leader in efforts to develop broader, more rational, and more effective programs for vision care for children on local, state, and national and international levels. Dr. Moore is co-chair of the Children's Vision Massachusetts Coalition and a member of the National Center for Children's Vision and Eye Health. He's been a principal investigator in the National Eye Institute-funded multi-center study of vision screening of children, the Vision of Preschoolers study, which aims to develop an efficient, effective battery of vision screening procedures that are applicable to broad use of preschoolers throughout the United States. Another major, major research and policy interest of Dr. Moore concerns eye care for the developing world. A variety of collaborations and efforts at the New England College of Optometry extending to Asia, Central America, and Africa have been undertaken to better understand and solve these problems. I give you Dr. Moore. Thank you very much, Kira, and thank you to School Health and uh, Prevent Blindness America for uh, hosting this webinar this afternoon. And, Thank you to all the people that are participating in it. Uh, I'd like to comment uh, a little bit about the epidemiology of amblyopia. Uh, it's already been mentioned by both Dr. Ramsey and Dr. Bradford that somewhere around 3% of the population of young children develop amblyopia. Um, it's important to note that if you look at the population of the United States under the age of 45 years of age, there is more significant loss that is caused by amblyopia than all of the causes of vision loss combined. Now think about that. When most of us think about vision loss, we think about vision loss in adults and particularly the elderly. Dr. Bradford mentioned macular degeneration, diabetes, glaucoma and cataracts. That accounts for only a very, very small percentage of vision loss in children. In some total, that 3% of children developing amblyopia in the United States per year amounts to about 150,000 children a year in this country. Most of those, as was pointed out, are readily detectable at an early and treatable age. Most of those individuals could be effectively treated and the problem of their vision loss can go away. The problem in this country is that we have simply not developed a system that works anywhere as well as we would like it to be. Now, in the first slide, uh, talking about children at highest risk requiring immediate referral, uh, the things that are listed on here at this moment are all conditions that are, in many cases, very obvious. It starts off with strabismus. Strabismus is crossed eyes. In young children, most strabismus, not all by any means, but most strabismus is really quite obvious. That's particularly true in infancy. It becomes a little more difficult as children get to be three and four years of age. But if you see a child with an obvious crossing or turning in or turning out of the eyes, 
This is a serious warning problem. This indicates that something serious has already gone wrong with that child's visual system. This child doesn't really require any additional screening. This child requir uh, requires referral as soon as possible. A child that has any kind of central nervous system dysfunction in a major way, including things like developmental delay, things like cerebral palsy or seizures or Down syndrome or other conditions similar to that, these are children that are at extremely high risk of developing very important vision problems. For example, a child with cerebral palsy or Down syndrome has probably at least a 75% likelihood of having a very important vision problem that contributes to um, preventing them from fully reaching their potential. Because learning occurs so early, if a child with Down syndrome has very poor vision, it's really going to have a huge impact on those individuals. These children need referral immediately. Uh, as both Dr. Ramsey and Dr. Bradford pointed out, a white pupil is indicated by the slide on the right on the bottom. This is a serious problem. This child might have a cataract. This child might also have something even of greater concern, which is a retinoblastoma, a particularly virulent type of cancer that can affect the eye and can be a major cause of mortality in those children that go untreated for a period of time. Again, these children require a referral right away. Then there's a condition which is called visual inattentiveness. And visual inattentiveness means more or less what it says. These are children that seem to have relatively poor or perhaps even absent visual awareness as to what's going on within their environment. This might be a child that, for example, when the mother smiles at a child, the child does not respond because the child may not be able to see or the child may not be able to use the vision in their visual cortex and process it in a way that provides vision as we, as we know it. Uh, again, these children require a referral as soon as possible. In addition, there are many other children that really require referral uh, at an early stage and probably should bypass screening as we know it. Uh, a question that comes up in my experience almost continuously is how do we screen a child who has autism? And the answer is very simply that it's very difficult for anyone to screen a child with autism. It's frankly very difficult to examine a child with autism. These are individuals that in ideal uh, manner need to be referred to a pediatric eye doctor who is willing to work with these children. Our ability to screen these children is unfortunately very limited at the present time. A child that is already in an early intervention program is obviously a child that's already been identified as having significant developmental problems. These children as well need to go directly to an eye examination. We already know that they're in a high-risk group. And a child that's in a high-risk group needs really to bypass the screening and go directly to the examination process. That's equally true with children where there is already a strong history of either amblyopia or strabismus or very high refractive error, parent or another sibling, for example, wearing very thick glasses, or in any family where early and serious eye disease of uh, a myriad of varieties exists. These children, again, are at a high risk already. The purpose of screening is to identify a high risk population. If a child comes with high risk already attached to them, they need to go directly to the examination process. Um, if we think about moms during their pregnancy who are using either drugs or alcohol, or moms during their pregnancy had a significant maternal infection, things like um, cytomegalovirus or herpes or other kinds of conditions like that. All of those children in those sets of conditions are also at very high risk of problems and ideally ought to have an examination by a pediatric eye doctor. 
a little bit less certain are children with significant learning disabilities. Uh, even though there is not an absolutely direct connection between vision problems and learning problems, it is, I think, fairly obvious to most of us that a child that has great difficulty with their vision and has very high refractive error is a child that is almost certainly at an increased risk of having difficulty acquiring reading and pre-reading skills. Uh, a child that is really struggling in school in the very early years would certainly benefit by having an eye examination to at least determine if there is a problem of that sort. question that comes up all the time that I think every one of the panelists hears almost constantly uh, occurs when a child is screened and a child's behavior is difficult to manage. And as a result, you're really not sure about the screening results. And in our language, we call that a child that's untestable on screening. The question comes up, should we wait a while and then rescreen the child in the future? How long should we wait? What circumstances? What I could tell you is that, as I've reiterated now a number of times, screening is designed to identify a child at high risk of having the disorder, in this case a vision problem. If you attempt to screen a child and that screening goes poorly, if the child is either completely non-compliant or if you just simply are unable to get results that are meaningful to you, what do you do in that situation? Well, in the largest study of preschool vision screening, that's the vision of preschool study that I've been involved in for many years. One of the important findings in that study on over 5,000 children that had comprehensive eye examinations carried out by pediatric optometrists and ophthalmologists, we found that children that underwent screening and the screening was determined to be untestable. If we then did com comprehensive examinations on those children, we found that a remarkably high percentage of those children turn out to have significant vision problems that require treatment or at least our awareness of their existence. So what I would then say based on that is that if you have a child that is otherwise uh, a relatively normal behavior child and you screen them and you're unable to get results, that child should be considered a referral. There may be circumstances where, for example, the child just had uh, an immunization performed 10 minutes before the screening, which unfortunately happens sometimes. Well, that might be a good argument for having the child come back in a few weeks and redoing the screening. But I think at that point, it certainly makes sense to refer that child as soon as possible. The other point I want to make is that we're talking about vision screening here and we're talking about referral for examination. The implication of talking about vision screening is that you are going to be doing a series of tests, whether they're a visual acuity test or a test of binocularity, the use of both eyes together as a pair, or whether perhaps you're using an instrument-based screening to determine the child's refractive error. Those are all techniques that we ordinarily utilize and are, of course, very effective depending on the circumstances. But I would guess that virtually every single person that is on this webinar right now is an individual that has a great deal of experience in being with children, in working with children, and having a fairly unique opportunity of being around large numbers of children at the same time and looking at their behavior and, frankly, looking at their health issues you're in a particularly good position to identify children that have problems that are outside the range of normal. Because of all of your experience, you have a pretty good idea that if a child is behaving visually in a certain way, or if you're seeing something with a child's eyes or visual system that doesn't seem to you as if there is something uh, not normal, then it is totally appropriate for you to go ahead and think about making a referral even if a more formalized type of screening apparently did not identify the problem. I guess what I'm saying is that because you are such good observers, you're in a position to do screening in a different way 
just based upon the child's behavior and the child's general uh, visual awareness. So I think that's all I'm going to say at this point, and I'll pass it back to Kira. Thank you, Dr. Moore. And um, I understand that you and Dr. Block had, had communicated earlier today, so you may be helping us through this next portion. Um, but I do want to recognize uh, Dr. Block and give her background. Dr. Block received her optometry degree in 1981 through the Illinois College of Optometry, after which she completed a pediatric residency at the same institution. She's been a professor of optometry on faculty at the Illinois College of Optometry since 1982, when she completed her residency. In 1988, Dr. Flock completed her Master of Education from National Lewis University, and she's been the Global Clinical Advisor Consultant to the Special Olympics Lions Club International Opening Eyes Program since 1995, and has been instrumental in developing the vision screening program that is now conducted globally. Her interests lie in primary eye care for children of all ages, with a special social focus on persons with disabilities, as well as the process of diagnosis and treatment of visually related learning problems. Dr. Block is the medical director for the Illinois Eye Institute School-Based Vision Clinic at Princeton Elementary School. And this is a school-based vision clinic that serves the Chicago Public School children. Dr. Block has authored numerous publications, conducted presentations to students and peers. She's been invited to present all over the world. Dr. Block has been an active member of the American Academy of Optometry and American Optometric Association, and sits on the board of Prevent Blindness America. She's a fellow and has achieved a level of diplomat in public health and environmental optometry at the American Academy of Optometry, as well as a fellow of optometrist in visual development. I give you Dr. Block, perhaps assisted by Dr. Moore. Okay. First of all, I'd like to thank School Health. I'm not sure everybody can hear me, but if you can, I'd like to thank School Health. And also, uh, Dr. Moore is going to go through my slides because I thought it would be easier for you to hear and understand what I wanted to convey to you. So at this point, I'm going to turn the slides over to Dr. Moore. OK, well, thank you, Sandy. And uh, unfortunately, you came down with laryngitis this morning. Not good timing. So. Uh, Dr. Block's first slide is titled Recap, and the important point here, I think, is that uh, all of you in the Head Start community have a very serious challenge, and that challenge is that you are required to do some type of a screening process on every child in the first 45 days of the school year, and that means that by this time of year, for virtually all of you, every child in your program, and that's over a million children across the country, need to be screened. Uh, unfortunately, up until now, you have not really been given a whole lot of guidance from, um, from anyone about what to do. You're following a variety of local and state guidelines. There really are some suggestions from national organizations. But at this point, many of you are left with a lot of questions. You're left with questions for the three to five year old population, but you're left with even more questions about the zero to three population in early Head Start programs. And one of the things that we're hoping this year as part of the Year of Children is to provide uh, a greater level of guidance for all of you because we fully recognize that you have a very serious challenge ahead of you. You are challenged as well by the question of what to do with a child with the whole spectrum of neurodevelopmental delays and neurodevelopmental problems, which again includes everything within the autism spectrum. In some way, you have to meet federal guidelines that are imposed on you to do something about screening these children. And you talk to your local eye doctors, and you're probably left with a lot more questions than you have answers for. Uh, at this point in time, our recommendation is really not to screen these children, but send these children along for examination as soon as possible. Because they have a much higher risk of eye problems, as I said before. Kids with cerebral palsy and Down syndrome um, frankly have a likelihood of having significant problems that are going to complicate in a great way their ability to be in the Head Start program and your ability later on of getting an education. Whoops. When we talk about screening, 
uh, it's really important to emphasize that screenings are simply meant to detect a high-risk population. I've said this now several times, and I say it because there is an enormous amount of confusion that exists uh, across the country and around the world about what screening is and what screening isn't. It does not in any way, shape, or form provide a diagnosis, and it does not in any way, shape, or form recommend a specific set of treatments. It only identifies a child as likely or at least at greater risk of having a problem. Only a comprehensive eye examination can really accomplish those means. And in truth, for eye doctors who primarily work with adult or elderly populations, it's a great challenge to them working with a three-year-old. It's not something that they're used to. If they're more typically treating uh, elderly people with glaucoma or cataracts, they're not so experienced and frankly not very comfortable in working with young children. So again, you're all put in the position of having to identify referral sources within your respective communities. And our recommendation to you is to try to identify referral sources that either have specific pediatric training or at least have offices and practices that are interested and willing to take care of the particular needs of young children. It's been stated before, what are we looking for when we screen? Well, more than anything else, we're looking for problems like refractive error, nearsightedness and farsightedness and astigmatism, differences between the two eyes as far as refractive error is concerned, and also things like decreased quality of vision, decreased visual acuity as we say. These are not necessarily easy things to do in three-year-old children, and frankly, they're extremely difficult to do in two or one-year-old children. So we are really in the process now of developing automated types of equipment that takes some of the human element and some of the necessity of having uh, a lot of experience and training in working with children that age out of the equation. Uh, there are technologies that are evolving right now that are available to some degree at this time, still being investigated in many cases, but it's our belief that within the next several years, there are going to be automated technologies that are going to make your task a lot easier and will hopefully also bring down the age that screening is most effective below the current barrier of roughly three years of age down to children younger than that and perhaps even to infancy, although we really don't know yet if that's going to be possible. The reason why we emphasize early detection and early treatment is because it makes the treatment much more effective. As Dr. Bradford especially uh, stated earlier, and Dr. Ramsey, uh, amblyopia becomes progressively more difficult to treat as a child gets older. There's a, a broad perspective that children over a certain age, perhaps around age seven or so, become very difficult, if not almost impossible, to treat if they have amblyopia. And while that is true to a degree, it's not necessarily always the case. So even in some older children, 10 years of age, perhaps even older than that, there are things that can be done for at least some of these children. And one of the most important first steps is simply put a pair of glasses on the child if the child needs glasses. It turns out that glasses alone will effectively treat amblyopia in perhaps a quarter or maybe even a third of individuals if they have not had refractive correction in the form of glasses at an earlier age. So we do believe that even though it's very difficult to treat as age increases, it's not impossible and still identifying a child and getting them to uh, a comprehensive exam and treatment is still a really important thing to do. It's worth mentioning that this increasing difficulty in treatment with age is probably based on two very, very broad categories of problems. Problem one is a loss of plasticity in the visual system. And that simply means that it's easier to make changes in the brain and the visual system when a child is younger. 
probably easier for new connections to be made and for old connections to be modified inside the visual system in the brain at a younger age. But it's not only plasticity that's the problem. The biggest problem, frankly, from uh, the perspective of, of eye doctors is compliance. It's easy enough, or I should say hard enough, to get a three-year-old child to wear a patch. It's harder to get a seven-year-old child to wear a patch, and I suspect it's not very easy at all for anybody to imagine a 12 or 15-year-old child going off to school with a patch on the eye. So the issue of compliance is really a major problem, and that's one of the reasons why we try to uh, get the treatment accomplished as early as possible. Uh, this is pretty much what I've already mentioned. And it's also just worth adding this final point on the slide that a child with a neurodevelopmental problem is very likely to have a host of other problems, including vision problems, including hearing problems, including speech problems, including all the things that uh, people in the Head Start environment, early childhood environment, are already concerned about and screening for. So often these conditions happen uh, in a pattern. and They don't happen in isolation. And the more developmentally challenged a child is, the more likely that a vision problem exists, and in some ways the more difficult it is to affect treatment. And I think finally there's a really important point. We can screen effectively. We can get kids to examination not as often as we screen them in many cases. But if we don't follow through with the entire process of screening, detection, and underlying treatment, then ultimately we collectively fail at remediating the problem for that child. So all of us play a very important role in this. The eye doctors do the treatment. But frankly, many of you who are involved in the education of children you get to spend time with these children over an entire school year. They're with you for many hours a day. You are in a position to probably have as much of an influence over the success of treatment as any of the eye doctors might. You can work with the parents. You can help to educate the parents as to the importance of effective treatment. There may be possibilities in your own locations of having a pair of glasses kept at school so that the child will at least benefit by having good refractive correction for six hours a day. You may be in the best position to ensure that if a child needs to be patched, the patching might be accomplished in your setting in the school, that you may, it, you may be able to enlist the other children in the classroom to help that child be treated effectively. And it might also provide a wonderful educational opportunity for everyone in the classroom, all the children, teachers as well, to understand the issues about handicaps in children, disabilities in children, the diversity of children, and to help ensure that that particular child's vision is helped as much as possible in a collective manner. And I think this is pretty much what we've said before. It's already been stated that the treatment is glasses and surgery and patching. The other treatment sometimes is nothing, unfortunately, and nothing doesn't work all that often, but occasionally it does. So again, to summarize, the um, purpose of screening and comprehensive exam is to identify children at risk. If a child turns out to have a problem, it's critically important for the uh, sum total of the parent and the child and the school to work to try to improve that condition. And ultimately, all of us are concerned about the child's well-being. And um, together, we can hopefully do a more effective job than any one of us separately. Uh, I thank you for Sandy and for myself. Thank you. We want to take a few minutes for questions. Do we have any in the queue, Sarah?
Dara, I believe your phone is muted at the moment. All right, sorry about that. Can, everyone, can you hear me? Um, we do have questions. So um, we are at time, but if uh, some of you would like to stick around and um, listen, that would be great. Otherwise, we can summarize um, the questions that were asked with some answers in the follow-up email that you'll receive with the recording. Um, so the first question um, is from Sandra. What is directed to um, Dr. Moore? What is recommended to use to screen three to four-year-old students who may have CP or neurodevelopmental problems as PDD? Titmus slides or something better? Well, I think that's a great question, and um, at least from my perspective, the, the answer to that is that attempting to screen a child for cerebral palsy or other major neurodevelopmental problems is very challenging. And it's challenging even for pediatric eye doctors to be able to complete a comprehensive examination of some of those children. Um, my opinion is that those children really should not be screened. They should go directly to an eye examination that will require a lot of effort and a lot of time spent to try to understand as much as possible what's going on with that child. Uh, I'll give you an example. The incidence of strabismus in a child with cerebral palsy increases quite dramatically through the um, early years of life so that by, say, age 10 or so, probably a majority of those children have strabismus. Uh, what that translates to is that if you have a three-year-old who at that point does not have strabismus, or amblyopia, the odds are pretty good that they ultimately will. So our recommendation would be get that child to a pediatric eye doctor, probably bypass the screening process, put your screening efforts into the more typically developing children. And I know that it does present some issues that probably need to be addressed as far as um, people from uh, the federal government who do your audits every three years. But I think a good case can be made that if you can affect that child getting a comprehensive exam, that will work both to the child's benefit and also, I think, to your benefit by being able to put your efforts into children that um, probably are, are more. Uh, a copy of the slides um, post-webinar, if you have asked that question. This is a question for Dr. Black. Um, I'm sorry, I misspoke. Uh, a question for Dr. Ramsey. What should be the course of action for an eight-year-old with slight business? I have been told to wear heavy framed glasses without lenses. Is this helpful from Jane? Um, well, thank you for the question. I'm not sure I understand um, the question. They're heavy framed lenses. Could you say that again? Repeat the question. Sure. She wrote, uh, it's an eight-year-old with slight business. She's been told uh, to wear heavy framed glasses without lenses. Is this helpful? Um, well, um, without lenses, that would be, um, I guess I interpret that, that there's no prescription in it, and that would not be the case. But a child, many children, who do, have, many of them do have to wear a high prescription you know, because one of the reasons their eyes is crossing is that they they have a lot of farsightedness, more than the normal child. So if you're looking at their glasses, they may appear heavy framed and they may appear thick. And the purpose of the glasses, of course, is to do the focusing so the child's eyes can straighten out. So the question would be, with the glasses in place, are the eyes straighter? I hope that answers the question. Okay. Thank you. Um, and a question for Dr. Bradford. Is it OK to single out a letter in a box from a cluster on the HOTV chart? I, thank you for the question. I uh, would say in general that it's not OK to do that, um, that uh, if the eye chart being used has a, a line of uh, shapes or letters on it, that uh, it uh, inaccurately um, overestimates the level of a youngster's uh, 
visual acuity if they're allowed to disregard the rest of the letters on that line and if one uh, symbol or letter is uh, is uh, isolated uh, or uh, aggressively pointed out um, it makes it makes the screener's job a little easier but it's not recommended to to block out the rest of the letters on that line because it artificially enables the child to see that uh, individual uh, shape or letter more easily than they would otherwise be able to do and you can miss uh, youngsters who uh, have amblyopia or you can uh, misgauge the amount of amblyopia that they might have uh, if you single out letters like that. So it's a good idea to, uh, if you feel you need to guide the child, uh, to do it with verbal clues. Uh, and if, uh, if the screener really does feel that they need to uh, direct the child's attention, maybe they could use a finger or a pencil and uh, without blocking out the other letters in any way on that line, uh, perhaps from above or below, points to the letter. Uh, without crossing the the lines of the letter uh, from above or below and uh, and, and uh, help direct the child's attention uh, in that manner. And um, I just wanted to check with our presenters. Do we have a few more minutes for a few more questions? I can stay. Okay. Thank you. Um, all right, so I will ask just a few more. Um, this is a follow-up um, from the previous question to Dr. Ramsey. I believe that was to Dr. Ramsey about the, the heavy frames. Um, the reason for the heavy, this is from Jane, the reason for the heavy frames was to give the eye a perimeter. No vision loss was diagnosed. The eye wanders out. She may have um, used the wrong term earlier, she wrote. I'm not sure if Dr. Rams, do you have any more um, to comment on that? But um, that was just a follow-up. OK, so I think I understand. So the, you're saying the eye drifts out, which is the exotropia. So they put larger frames in order to give the child more, more vision when the eye drifts. Well. In all honesty, that's not something that I routinely do. And in fact, when the eye drifts, and we talked about the brain shutting off the eye, the vision is suppressed somewhat in the eye. So um, I probably wouldn't be as concerned about making sure there's refraction um, with the eye drifting out. Um, I'd be curious to hear more about that, because that's just not something we do in our practice. Thank you. Thank you. Um, this is a question for uh, Dr. Moore. Uh, we use the PediaVision Auto Refractor Screener. Do you find this to be an effective screening tool? Uh, good question. Uh, I did mention that there are new generations of automated devices that are coming on the market at this point. The PediaVision Spot is one of uh, three devices that are currently uh, being used around the country in increasing numbers. And there is some data to show that it is uh, an effective tool. I should mention there are two other devices that are also commercially available and being used to some degree. There's the Plus Optics screener and there's also the Welsh Allen Shoresight. And all three of those um, measure the child's refractive error or need for glasses. The theory behind that is that a child that has amblyopia is a child that is very likely to have a high refractive error, particularly farsightedness or combination of farsightedness, hyperopia, uh, and unequal refractive error. And these devices can be very, very useful to do that. The Welsh Allen Shore site only measures one eye at a time. So first it measures the right eye, and then a moment later it measures the left eye. It doesn't do the best job of capturing differences between the eyes because there is an interval between measurement of the right and left eye. Both the plus optics and the PediaVision spot do that actually quite nicely. Uh, there are new versions of both instruments that have been on the market now for a relatively short period of time. 
the amount of data for both of those is still not as much as we would like it to be. We are um, encouraging manufacturers to provide to us information about the data that is coming from their machines so we can evaluate it more fully. Uh, I would say that I am actually myself currently looking at one of the instruments, the, the spot, and I think they, they actually have a lot of promise. The advantage of both of them, uh, along with the Welsh Allen, is that you simply press a button and you get a measurement. It is not very dependent upon whether or not the person pressing the button presses the button correctly. Simply getting a reading means that the machine has made an estimate of the validity of that particular set of measurements. So there is probably going to be a strong trend in the future to some degree away from subjective testing like visual acuity testing and stereo testing in the direction of refractive testing with devices. I would say stay tuned. The data will be out probably within a year or so for those, those devices. And I think at that point we'll be able to make uh, a, a better and more definitive statement about the value. But again, they do serve the purpose of taking some of the human tester element out of the equation. May I make a comment here? Um, um, we had done a survey, we sent out a survey of um, Head Start folks, and almost 50% reported that they are using instrument-based screening, or their children are being screened through, as Bruce was talking about, instrument-based screening. In February, we will be having another, we have a number of webinars planned, but February's webinar will be on instrument-based vision screening. Okay, I'm going to ask one last question and then uh, we will wrap things up. And if there were questions that were not addressed, we will um, work to address those in a, a follow-up um, questions document. So I'm going to combine, uh, we're having a couple questions about um, how to screen the 0 to 3 age population. Um, one directed towards Dr. Bradford. Uh, one noted that they use a camera screener with Polaroid film and the picture is sent to an eye doctor. And then we just had another um, general question about what the what is rec currently recommended for this age group. Well, I, I'm happy to begin answering this. If any of the other uh, panelists want to uh, add to my comments, uh, please feel free to. Uh, the reason that there are, I believe, several people uh, posing this question is because it's a, it's so common that uh, that and and the answer is uh, is not well known, uh, which which makes it frustrating for people in early Head Start who um, I appreciate are are required to to do uh, an assessment on these uh, very young. Uh, infants and toddlers. So the quick answer is that there are no national guidelines for uh, vision screening uh, by uh, folks who are uh, not pediatricians uh, uh, published. Uh, and I'll submit that uh, even pediatricians have a difficult time uh, screening uh, vision development in these, uh, these very young uh, youngsters. Uh, so uh, with the caveat that uh, this is uh, solely my opinion uh, and uh, is, is not certainly based on published uh, uh, formal guidelines, I would offer that if the uh, very uh, young person appears to have well-aligned eyes, uh, that there doesn't look like there's any uh, crossing or drifting or misalignment in general, uh, that certainly is a good sign. Uh, one way to perhaps look at the eyes uh, while uh, thinking about their alignment would be to simply shine a flashlight at their face and look to see if the uh, little pinpoint reflection uh, of that flashlight is centered in the youngster's uh, pupils. Uh, and both pupils uh, symmetrically have this uh, 
this reflex centered. That, that's a very general sign, but a very helpful sign that the uh, eyes are aligned when the youngster is looking at the flashlight. Uh, that would be one method. Uh, another method would be uh, for the person doing the assessment to have a toy or something that would be visually stimulating uh, for that youngster and hold it out uh, about arm's length away from the youngster and simply cover one of the eyes and then move the toy around and see if the youngster is comfortable following that toy uh, with just one eye. Uh, there's a caveat here that the youngster may not appreciate having uh, the hand in front of their face because they may be fearful of having one eye covered. But if the youngster does feel comfortable having your hand um, up to the face, you can cover one eye and see how interested they are in uh, looking with the uncovered eye. And then use that experience that you've just gained and cover the opposite eye and do the same thing. Is the child equally interested in the toy? You might have to use another toy because youngsters become quickly disinterested in the same thing. So you might need to have a pocket full of toys. But if the youngster seems to be just as comfortable uh, using one eye as the other eye, that too is a very general sense, uh, gives you a very general sense that uh, eyesight uh, is uh, at least developing in a very general fashion uh, in a good way and symmetrically in both eyes. Uh, a third caveat would be to uh, simply uh, ask the parents, uh, and instead of doing a direct assessment on the youngster, uh, the, the family, if they're an involved family with that youngster, and we certainly all hope that to be the case, even though we know well that it often isn't, but if the family can also provide a history to you and you ask the uh, family member uh, the questions that we've kind of addressed throughout today's webinar, do you see any crossing? Do you see any drifting? Do you have any concerns about the, your child not seeing well? Uh, are there things about the appearance of the eyes that are a concern for you? And you can almost do a, a, a screening assessment simply by asking the uh, family uh, who may be present uh, what specific concerns they may have. And there are certainly lists of questions that are available from a variety of sources published and on the internet about the series of questions that uh, somebody could ask. Uh, of, of a parent to see if there are any um, potential vision problems there. Uh, if I can add something to that, um, the device that uh, the questioner had uh, been asking about is, I'm pretty sure, the MTI photo refractor. That is a device that's been around for probably close to 15 years. Uh, it suffers from one problem, and that is, as was pointed out in the question, it requires Polaroid film. Uh, I'm in Boston, actually, looking right across the river to where Polaroid's headquarters used to be and no longer is because Polaroid no longer is. Uh, as a company, they're no longer in business. They're not making film anymore. So there is, to my knowledge, a minimal to non-existent availability of film for that camera that presents a problem. There was some fairly good data that came out of some early studies with that that did show some efficacy. But I think most people today would hazard a guess that it was, shall we say, a first generation device. And other devices will be coming along that will simulate some of what that did, but probably do a better job with digital imaging. The other thing I want to mention is that this issue of zero to three year old screening um, is really a burning question for all of us that are in the field of pediatric eye care. There was a report issued about two years ago now from a body called the United States Preventative Services Task Force. These are the same people that have issued um, very controversial reports in recent years about the efficacy of mammography for women under the age of 50, for screening for prostate cancer, and for a whole variety of other things, and I'm sure everyone remembers some bits and pieces about reports that have been issued. It's a government body that looks at screening procedures of all types in this country and makes assessments of the value of the screening and the efficacy 
of the screening tools that are available. The report they issued two years ago was broken down into two pieces. The first piece had to do with children three to five years of age. And it made a pretty strong recommendation that for children three to five years of age, screening ought to be done, that there are pretty good and pretty effective tools for that. And essentially, it ought to be part of national and local policy. They issued a separate report about zero to three-year-olds. And they found a couple of things with that. One is that they did not believe that there was sufficient evidence available at the time the report was written, probably three or four years ago, to uh, argue that there was great value in screening zero to three-year-olds. Well, a lot of pediatric eye doctors had a lot of issue with that and frankly don't believe that to be the case. We do believe that there is certainly value in screening zero to three-year-olds. We do agree, however, for the most part with the other recommendation or the other uh, point they made, which is we don't actually know what those screening tools are today, that there are not really good, well-validated screening tools that are available for that population, and there are virtually no studies that have actually looked at screening tools for the zero to three population. Some of the automated devices that I mentioned before may ultimately turn out to be very useful in that population, or there may be other ways of doing it. Uh, Dr. Bradford mentioned that there are a lot of developmental assessments that can reasonably be done. And um, it's worth pointing out that the screening system that is extremely effective in Scandinavian countries actually is a screening system that primarily utilizes developmental assessments and asking questions, specifically a visual development to the parents and caregivers to the children. And the system there really works extraordinarily well. And there is the beginning of some research efforts in this country to see if we can um, incorporate elements of that into what we're doing here. Thank you so much. Um, I am going to close the question and answer session for right now. Kira, did you have um, anything, any closing statements yes. to make? If you could just advance the next slide. Um, I just want to thank all of the presenters for their time today and uh, the wonderful information they've shared. I think uh, the extra time we've been able to take for questions um, and, and the great answers that you all gave really shows the interest in this topic. So I'm glad we were able to take that time. Just a reminder that today's webinar will be archived and available online. So we'll send a link out to all those that registered today and obviously make it available through our listserv. And I think that will be on the School Health website and also we'll try to make it available on the Your Children's Vision website. Um, just uh, if this was uh, of interest today, just be on the lookout for more Your Children's Vision events. Um, we'll be at the National Head Start Association Family Engagement Conference in December. Um, there is a BAM, uh, National Head Start Association BAM radio uh, network podcast coming. And then always check out the Air Children's Vision website. The address is there on your screen. Uh, we'll have more information. There's already a ton of resources on that website for, um, to help you with your children's vision program. So again, thanks everybody for attending. And uh, thank you again to all of our presenters and School Health for sponsoring.